Today is day 4,568 of Boswell being in business, and we're so pleased to welcome Sarah Byron in conversation with Andrew DeYoung. And um, they are both going to be uh, talking about this wonderful book, Bend in the Road. But before that, I would like to also introduce Wyatt Keither, who is uh, working with the production farm. And um, so now I'm going to disappear, and Wyatt's going to take over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit. I, would, I feel very fortunate as uh, the production farm to be uh, chosen as uh, something to be highlighted uh, by Sarah here and her showing up at a brat fry that we're doing as a fundraiser for us. Uh, we are a not-for-profit uh, behavioral mental health uh, agency in northeastern Wisconsin. We are uh, very outside of the box. We are very unconventional with our approaches that we're doing and is 100% client focused, 100% custom and unique to each individual that we're working with. We come at it from a very creative, uh, musical story, art-driven, play-based background uh, that is something that is not necessarily what is given to a lot of different uh, people in a lot of different settings. Uh, so this is something we try to get out there and work very hard to make sure that <laughs> Uh, everybody knows in the world that there's nothing wrong with behavioral and mental health, that there's something to be celebrated, that people are working on healing and working on taking care of uh, things that they specifically need to work on. So uh, thank you all for being here. Thank you, Sarah, for support uh, and bringing us on board on this thing. I cannot tell you how much that means uh, to us over here. So with that, I will uh, get out of everyone's way and just say thank you. Thanks for being here tonight. I'm glad you could be here. Thanks, Wyatt. Um, I think that's our cue, Sarah. It's our turn. <laughs> here we are again. Here we are again. Um, so for those who don't know, um, Sarah and I um, published, our, our debut novels came out the exact same day in 2017. Um, we both lived in the same part of the country at the time in the Twin Cities area. And we had a, a co uh, launch party um, and we're just like launch I don't know what did we call each other launch buddies um, launch buddies basically um, for the for the debut and ever since then you know I've been involved in every single one of Sarah's launches <laughs> really really honored um, to be part of it Sarah um, and as we get started today talking just want to quickly read the um, description of this book um, Bend in the Road just so that we all uh, know what we're talking about. And if, if there's anyone on the call who hasn't bought this book yet, um, you should definitely do so um, right away, buy it from Boswell Books. Um, so I'll just read it here. 17-year-old um, Gabe's life is a mess. His debut album, produced by his rock star dad, made him an overnight sensation, but his second album tanked. He just got dumped by his on-again, off-again girlfriend, and he's desperate to come up with the money he needs to fix a major screw up. The only place he can be free from the paparazzi and rumors is the family farm, the farm that 17 year old Juniper's family has managed since before she was born. When Juniper learns that Gabe's about to inherit the farm, she worries that he'll sell it. She comes up with a plan to get close to him and stop that from happening. At first, Juniper and Gabe couldn't be more at odds, but the more time they spend with each other, the more they grow to like each other. Can they set aside their differences to do what's best for the farm and each other? Or will all the drama and secrets tear them apart? Sarah, does that sound familiar? Did I read the right one? He did. You do that so well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's so it. That's, that's the it. Book. That's the book. And if you want to find the answers to those questions that I read at the end, you're going to have to, you're going to, have to buy it, obviously. Um, buy it and read it. Um, but Sarah, where did, you, um, where did you get the idea <clears throat> for this book? Where did it come from? Well, um, first, I just want to just go back very briefly to our launch party, um, our dual launch party that we held at this awesome location in, in Minneapolis, um, mm -hmm. a church called Solomon's Porch. Yep. And we had a band who played, the band played at our launch event. And the band is actually the band Dig Me Under from this book. Your so, husband's band. Husband's, yes. Well, so we'll get to that later, but I just wanted to give a little sneak peek about that story. Um, We're definitely going to talk about that 
we're going to talk about that more because it's a it's an Easter egg that you kind of put in this book. Um, that's a lot of fun to find. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how did I get the idea? So that is also um, goes back to the Minnesota days. So I actually started this book in 2014. It was just a glimmer of an idea in 2014. But um, <clears throat> before we moved to Wisconsin, we lived in a small town uh, called Hanover, Minnesota. And Hanover um, has very famous resident, sort of very, very part-time resident um, by the name of Bob Dylan. And um, he lives on this big farm, they call it the compound. Um, and I was driving past one day thinking about Bob and his son Jacob. And, you know, I, like you can't drive past without thinking about Bob. And I thought to myself, you know, it's pretty cool that Bob Dylan has a house in in Hanover, but wouldn't it be even cooler if it was like Chris Cornell? So this was obviously <laughs> before Chris died. Um, and so then all of a sudden I started thinking about uh, a rock star who lives on this farm in Minnesota and what would happen if his son came to the farm. And of course, you know, then there's the caretaker's daughter and things need to happen. So that is that's where the book got its start. And it, so you were writing it since 2014 or it was just kind of, it was kind of <sighs> residing in your mind for several years? Mostly, mostly in my head for seven. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So did the idea for this book predate the idea for your debut? Last, uh, last thing you said? No. no. So you just kind of like, you marinate, you marinate ideas for a good long time. I like that word. Yes, That's I do. Great. That's in other cool. words, I'm a very slow writer. No, no, no. I mean, like, it takes as long as it's supposed to take. That's correct. That's true. Um, this book is part of a, a series of sorts. I mean, um, there's, no, there's, there's no direct connection or continuing story between this and the previous two books, but they have a very similar cover design, and everyone is based around, so far, is based around a different season. Yes. Um, Last thing, last thing you said, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, last thing you said was summer. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, cold day in the sun, winter, and this one is um, autumn. One is autumn. Mm -hmm. Happy autumn, by the way, to everyone. Uh, the gorgeous happy, cover. Happy spooky gorgeous. season to all who celebrate. Um, it's good that we're <laughs> debuting uh, this book or bringing it out in, in autumn. Wh what is it about seasons like what what makes you want to center one book around every different season you know i think that was uh mostly a happy accident okay interesting and then when you noticed it then you then you uh, yeah when i on. noticed it i kept going <laughs> <laughs> so did you always think that this one would be set in autumn or did that kind of occur to you later after you noticed that it was going kind of seasonally uh no it was always it was always um, set, going to be set in autumn. So when I first started writing it, it was probably right around this time of year. <clears throat> and I remember that because uh, in October of that year, I went on a writing retreat. Um, and actually one of those retreaters is on the call today, Rebecca Fabian, one of my critique partners. Um, and we had taken a, uh, I just rented a house on Lake Superior, um, just north of Two Harbors, and there were seven of us. It was kind of like the real world, actually. It was um, <laughs> seven strangers picked to live in a house. I mean, like, we all knew one another from Twitter, and then I knew a yeah. couple of people from real life, but most of the people were just, like, just kind of randomly show up. Um, and we did this writing retreat, and I <laughs> was... Um, that idea was kind of marinating. I was actually working on the last thing you said at that retreat, um, but. Cool, yeah. when was that? I'm sorry. Um, that was October of 2014. October of 2014. So, but you were thinking of this as a fall book. Is there, is mm -hmm. there something, I don't know, like, like how do you pick the story for the season? Is there, is there some significance there as well? Or does it kind of like, whatever, whatever works? Um. Well, with the last thing you said, it I started um, 
I started writing that in the heat of summer. And so that, that of course, you know, I was writing a book about a resort town in Minnesota. And so of course that had to take place in the summer. Right. And then my hockey book, you know, probably needed to take place in the winter, but then this one just, um, just kind of felt right that it was set in the fall. Well, it is a farm book and I don't think that it's, it's not an apple orchard, but like, I don't know farms uh farmers farmers uh farmers markets it kind of yeah. makes sense harvest they sell yep. squash i feel like they talk about yeah they they bit. talk about squash <laughs> <laughs> do you have a favorite season i mean in the north in in the upper midwest here we talk a lot about how we have all four seasons we experience in one day one of them. in one day sometimes yep. yeah yeah um yeah my favorite season i can't even believe i'm gonna say this because i hate heat and humidity but summer is my favorite what? and so and mainly it's because it's just so it's so beautiful the colors are so vibrant and I love my favorite month is July um which I also hate because it's so gross um but I just love how the trees are just so gr- you know green against that blue sky I just love that so mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I love autumn and I loved this book. So I, but I don't know. I loved, I loved, I've loved all your books. The thing is like, you get to love all the seasons for different reasons when you live in this part of the world, I feel like. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Someone is already asking us a question, um, asking oh. if you have anything in mind for spring. If um, you're able to reveal it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Yes. <clears throat> yes, I have something in mind for spring. You have something. Okay. Yes. Actually, the question is, what do you have in mind? Oh, Maybe what? you don't want to answer that. <clears throat> you don't want to answer I, that. You know, I don't, um, I don't want to, you know, reveal anything. Um, but I can tell you that it is not set in Halcyon Lake and it is not set in Harper's Mill, which is the town in Bend in the Road. It is um, set in Duluth, Minnesota. Wow. Um, that w- would that be the first real setting? It will be the first real setting. Yeah. Yes. Excellent question. Because all of your books so far have been in fictionalized versions of, I'm guessing this one is a fictionalized version of Hanover. No, it's actually not. It's, it's not. No, it's a fictional town sort of north of Cloquet. Okay. And then the prior books, was it like nothing to a Chisago, lot of people. Chisago City? I'm sorry, we're um, getting Pequot like super, Lakes. Pequot Lakes. We're yeah, getting Pequot super Lakes. Midwesty about this whole thing. I know, like <laughs> most of the people on many of the people on the call know the little towns we're talking about here, but sure. a lot of them don't. So sorry. Yeah, sorry about that, folks. Yeah. <laughs> um, we'll try to keep it a little bit more general uh, from here on out. But so I'm so curious about because your books don't, it's not a continuing story. They're self-contained stories, but they seem to be in the same lightly fictionalized version of Minnesota. And I'm just, I'm always curious about what the books share. I will confess that I, ha- that I don't like reread the books before I read another one, but I'm always curious if you're like putting little connections between them or what else might connect them. Yeah, so, um, well, the first two books took place in the same town. Mm -hmm. Um, there is a restaurant that factors in pretty significantly in both books. Yeah. And there's pie. Actually, I think I probably mentioned pie and all, all everything I've ever written. Um, and maybe even cake. Love cake. Um, <laughs> sometimes the band you've mentioned cake the band in at least cake one of the your band books. Yes, yeah. exactly. <laughs> of course um, I mean they all in some way have music within them um, you know the last thing you said um, it's interesting that you asked that question because I have I have a specific theme that kind of runs through all of my books but there is one band that I have mentioned in all three books Mm. and you would, and like, if anyone who knows me is probably thinking like poison, we're getting getting some guesses. We're getting guesses. It might be, no, it's not poison. It's Pink Floyd actually. So Pink Floyd is mentioned in all three of my books. Yes. Are you a big Pink Floyd fan? I am. 
my family is <laughs> GB laden. Oh, Jana. So Jana, <laughs> um, yeah, that is definitely, uh, GB Layton is definitely a, a Minnesota local band, but yep. Foo Fighters. A lot of people would have said Foo Fighters. I right? was going to guess, I was going to guess Foo tonight. Fighters. Yeah. That would have been my guess. Um, but really, um, I guess when we're talking about themes, um, you know, life is, life is hard. And um, we all kind of go through a lot. And, you know, my first book is about grief. Mm -hmm. And um, in my second book, Holland is facing a lot of pressure and sexism and anxiety. And then in this book, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on in Bend in the Road, um, just with family issues and mm -hmm. again, grief and um, you know, as you said at the beginning, Gabe's life is a mess. He's 17. He kind of rose to really fast stardom and then crushed and burned so fast. And, um, you know, just hard things happen in life and in fiction. And through everything, there's this sort of sense of optimism. Um, and I was thinking about it and even with like some of the quotes that I have put into my book or like the little I kind of think like sometimes my books have little taglines. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with the last thing you said, it was one of the quotes that Trixie would have said to Lucy, the main character, that it's a good day to have a good day. Right. Mm -hmm. So that is kind of throughout the book. And then with Holland, who was facing all these different challenges, it was keep moving forward, which is actually my kind of my personal one that I also use. Um, and then with Bend in the Road, um, there's, I don't want to give away any spoilers or anything, but there is um, one of the things that Juniper says to um, her friend Amelia is that today is someday. So, you know, we kind of put things off and wait for the right time to come. And, you know, someday I'll do this, someday I'll do that. And Juniper is saying, today it's Sunday. So there's just kind of like this feeling of optimism and just kind of taking the next step yeah. and doing, like they say in Frozen 2, um, when Anna is in the cave or whatever, and she's like, just take the, um, take the next right step. Mm -hmm. do the next right thing we're getting your life philosophy one uh one book at a time yeah I used to think I was like a big pessimist and then a few years ago I was like oh you know what I actually am kind of an optimist <laughs> great oh. to realize that's great <laughs> um one thing that I was noticing about when I was reading this book I mean it it um it jumped at, out at me right away in your two prior books you were very much writing about we'll just put it in quotes, regular teens. And then in this one, you do like this celebrity thing. And I'm wondering if that was a, if that was a challenge, if that was a new thing to write, yeah. to write a, to write a celebrity. Um, yeah. Yeah. Did you have to do like research? You even had like a gossip yes. column. You, you kind of had like a TMZ article in there. And I, yes. I kind of wondered if you like had to read some of the, some of the blogs to like figure out the cadences of the, of those articles. Oh yeah. I mean, you know, I try to, I, I don't read like a lot of that kind of thing, but, um, you know, when, when things come up on your, um, in Apple news or whatever, yeah, and you just have to read about what happened to, I don't know, some celebrity and the big breakup or whatever. I don't know. I get interested in stuff like that. So I do, I mean, like, I'm not reading that kind of thing all the time, but I read it. We all we all read more of it. We all read more of it than we would like to admit. Yeah, right? I mean, I I, I will mean, say I'm kind of a sucker for those people articles, um, yeah. that talk about like murders and you know stuff like that. Well, well, and you mentioned Bob Dylan and um his son Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Did did you kind of look into the the like famous father son or parent child celebrity things because it can be very brought and it felt real it felt real in your book you know not 
not so much. I would say more of what I do when I'm writing is I listen to a lot of music. Um, yeah. So, and, and, you know, let's be honest, this book went through a lot of revisions, <laughs> a lot. So they all do eventually. They all do. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, sometimes well, it's like you have the nugget of an idea and you just need someone smarter than you and who is not so close to the work to really help you, you know, excavate what the real, what you're really trying to say. Um, so, and um, I've got a few of those people on this call smarter than me. So thank you. You know who you are. Um, and by the way, speaking of people on the call, um, if anybody has any questions at any point, just pop them into the chat and we'll just kind of um, answer them as they come up. Um, talking a little bit more about the celebrity thing. Um, I mean, I was just so fascinated by it as a, as a premise, this, this celebrity coming to a small town. And um, my wife asked me about, about the book and I described it as like, and this is a compliment. I described it a little bit, uh -oh. a little bit like, no, this is going to be great. You're going to love it. I, I promise. A little bit like one of those um, Hallmark uh, Christmas movies, like where a fancy city person goes back to the small town, right? I mean, did you think about that at all? There's no gazebo. There's no, that's true. There's no gazebo. No. Wait, have you had a gazebo in any of your books? I want to say no. that there was a, no. I don't think so. I don't think so. Maybe, I just, Maybe I'll write one into the next. Actually, there's a there's a gazebo in Duluth at the Rose Garden. So I'll just write it into the next one. There you go. There needs to be a gazebo. But that's like, that's, I mean, that's that's a Hallmark channel, but that's also like Gilmore Girls. I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you need a gazebo. Somewhere in this quartet of right. seasonal <laughs> books, you need a gazebo. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you didn't think about Hallmark as you were writing it. I just, I just, it was just a way that I used to, to describe it to, to Sarah, to my wife. Nope, I didn't really think about Hallmark. Oh, you're just, you're just in more of like a rock star mindset than I am. Um, uh, probably, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I live with one, so. Well, let's talk about that then. Okay. Because, um, you know, you've got some instruments behind you and some like amps and stuff. Um, you have, you have a musician in the family, a rock star, um, yeah. uh, tell us about dig me under and how they ended up in this book. So as I was, um, kind of putting down my first ideas for this book and writing the opening of it, which I don't even think exists anymore, that particular opening, um, we were sitting in the living room. Um, because that is, this was at our old house in Hanover. That's really where I wrote most of everything was on our couch in the living room. And um, we were listening to music because that is also kind of a thing that we do. And I am pretty sure we were actually listening to Alice in Chains at the time. And I said to Troy, hey, I need the name. I need a name for a band. And this band would have been really big in the 90s, kind of a grunge band, sort of, you know, Soundgarden-ish, and then lost favor and had some, you know, issues and then made a big comeback. I need a name. And he just said, well, dig me under, which is the is lyrics from an Alice in Chains song. So I was like, oh, okay, that's great. Went about my business and continued to work on it. And then the next thing I know, Troy is playing me a song and it's called The Last Thing You Said. So he's writing a song for my debut book and he <laughs> created a band called Dig Me Under. And so it's um, him and our friends, Kendall and Debbie and our friend, Mike and, um, Kendall and Troy re recorded this album. See that? Yep, I remember that. Yep, that Dig Me Under, cover. Across Your Sky. And it's a double album, um, a concept album. And so he, it, it's sort of um, 
about a rock star who uh, shoots to fame and it, you know, the fame goes to his head and he um, makes a lot of mistakes in his relationships and then he crashes and burns. And um, so they worked on this for quite a while. And that album actually was released on September 28th, 2018, mm. which was three years to the day before Bend in the Road came out. So. And the concept album, I mean, you're describing Gabe's dad, basically, right? I mean, the yeah. concept album yeah. about this. Yep, like, Chris Hudson. Did you, did, yep. you, did you kind of adopt some of what he no. done? For, no, you didn't. It's just like. <laughs> no, no, it's like two completely separate yet parallel creative endeavors. Um, so he, his album tells a different story okay. than what the story of the book. So even, I mean, it's about, I mean, it's about, you know, the lead singer of a band, mm -hmm. you could say it's about Chris, but the story that takes place in the book about Chris, so Gabe's mom and dad is completely different. The details are different. Yeah. Yeah. The details are different. And so, yeah, I mean, and Troy wrote a backstory for this band, which has a fictional lead singer. So it's kind of hard to play out when you don't like this guy doesn't really exist, but they make it work. It's great. And um, so there's a whole backstory and everything. So there are a couple of little nuggets of that backstory in the book, but yeah. It seems like you're, what you're describing, both you and Troy are fiction writers just working in different mediums yes, or mediums, something. Yep. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, we're getting some questions here. Okay. Um, someone has asked, how did you come up with the name of Gabe's second album, Embrace the Suck? Made me laugh and seemed apt. It made me laugh too. And, <laughs> and it ends up being something that the critics make fun of because it right, sucked. they're like, yeah, it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> oh, spoiler. Sorry. Oh, I mean, it's so early in the book, right? Yeah, oh. it's very early in the book. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so <laughs> I, oh boy, that's a fun, it's a funny question. So I work, I worked full-time for a marketing agency for several years in the Minneapolis area. And I, um, during that time, took some leadership courses and webinars and things like that. And there was this guy, um, Eric Thurwanger is his name, and his organization is called Think Great. And he, in one of his, um, in one of his leadership seminars, talked about like just some days things just suck and you just have to embrace the suck <laughs> and get, get it done and take care of the problem and move on. And so it was probably, I mean, that really resonated with me because um, it, you know, some days there was just a lot of suck to embrace. I mean, it just kind of depended on the day and um, so it, it resonated with me. And so I must have been thinking about that when I needed <laughs> the name for an album and it just sort of fit. <laughs> yeah, that's a, I feel like that's another, again, like you were just getting little nuggets from your personal philosophy in, in yeah. your book. Yeah. Um, we've got another question. Um, Liza is asking, um, was there anything that surprised you while you were writing this novel? Hmm. That's an excellent question. Um, so the, the writing of this novel was, um, interestingly enough, it, it happened during a really tough time for our family when we just, um, in the middle of a pandemic, packed up and moved to Wisconsin. Um, so we had lived for our house at our house in Hanover for 17 years. Um, my husband is originally from Wisconsin and had lived in Minnesota for a long time and um, had a job opportunity here. And um, we just we just decided <laughs> that it was the right thing to do. And so we sort of uprooted 
our family and moved and um, our son was a senior in high school last year and so he moved back to Minnesota and lived with friends so he could finish high school and so um, it was a tough um, it was it was this was a tough one for me um, just because of a lot of personal things that were going on and you know moving and driving back and forth to Minnesota many times. And I would um, I would drive our son to like the Hudson area in Wisconsin. So on the opposite side of Wisconsin for scout camps on the weekends. And I would stay in a hotel and eat um, Happy Cola, the Haribo <laughs> gummies, which are in the book. Um, I ate those just by the bag full <laughs> as I was I writing those. this. And yeah, the other they're great. fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And um, so kind of what's, I would say what was surprising to me was, yes, I did drink lots and lots of caribou, <laughs> caribou coffee, my favorite, um, is that my resilience showed up on the page hmm. or the resilience of my characters. So I would say that is probably, that was the biggest surprise because they, Gabe, they go both through Gabe some and stuff. Juniper, both, yeah. both of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so does that mean that you wrote a lot of this in the pandemic? Was this, was this at least partially a pandemic novel? Yes. Wow. Yes, it was. <laughs> Good for yep. you. Good for you, Sarah. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. you made it. <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I mean, at first it was like, yes, I don't have to go anywhere. I'm just going to sit on this couch and write this book. And it's going to be great because I don't have to drive anybody to dance or scouts or whatever. And it was not, mm -hmm. that is not how it, that's not yeah. how it went. Oh yeah. For, for anyone really. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, please. And again, please, um, keep uh keep putting questions in the chat i love the questions i wanted to pause um really quickly and ask talk a little bit about pizza ranch i'm going to get back into midwest stuff because i grew up in iowa in northwest iowa and the 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 midwest pizza chain pizza ranch was part of my childhood and i've never seen it my childhood and youth um <laughs> i've never seen it in a book but it showed up in the book not even and not only did it show up in the book it you kind of like went over the menu yeah someone likes it you went through the menu yeah, she does. like and it <laughs> truly is something i was so happy to see you talk about the pizza ranch buffet because really it's one of the only restaurants i know of that has as you say in the book pizza all named after like ranch themes like the rustler and the stampede and stuff like that and like macaroni salad um fried chicken yes thank you fried mashed potatoes fried potatoes mashed potatoes um and dessert pizza called uh cactus bread yes oh what <laughs> so i got some yeah. cactus bread tonight um it is it, exactly it's a dessert pizza that has some cinnamon uh, streusel crumble yeah. on it and some icing delicious mm. well it's just i mean first of all you have a certain nickname for it in the book that I think maybe people are just going to have to read the book to find out. Yeah, nickname. I think so. I want to know if people actually call it that, that you're aware of, because I never did in my hometown. Um, yes. Um, they do. So, okay. That's good um, to know. so my neighbor across the street in Hanover, it, um, Mel um, Brucker, I don't believe she is on tonight. Um, she is the person who told me about that nickname for it. Um, so, and she is, she's one of the nicest, funniest people you'd ever meet. And she was laughing so hard when she <laughs> told me about it that I could barely understand her. So, um, it's great. It's a great nickname and you'll just have to read the book to find out. You'll have to read the book to find out indeed. Yeah. Um, and the other question that I have, I mean, it was just so interesting to see that part of small town Midwestern culture show up in a book. And it made me wonder, like, is there any other like small town upper Midwest piece of culture that you would just love to squeeze into a book somehow? 
well, it felt very natural, by the way. Like it wasn't, you know, like, yeah. I don't know. I was just, I was just happy to see it. More loons. More loons. Oh, yes. So <laughs> yeah, the power loon, of course, the radio station in Cold Day in the Sun, the power loon is real. It is real oh. and you can listen to it. You can stream it. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So now that I live in Wisconsin, I would like to write about cheese. You should. I'm not even joking. I love yeah. cheese. And um, it's an amazing part of life here. You should write about how like almost every, like just the randomest places, the businesses that you go to in Wisconsin, they'll just like have cheese and beer for some reason. Cheese, curds. Cheese, cheese curds, beer. yeah. Yes. <laughs> and a bubbler. Yeah, and yeah. a bubbler. Kristen is saying now we need to have a bubbler, yeah. Water um, fountain for those who don't know, drinking fountain. That's what a bubbler is. Um, we do have a question that's that's a little bit further up. Um, someone's asking, what is some of the best writing advice you've ever received or the worst? Maybe you could give us one of each. Yeah, so um, probably the best writing advice that I've ever gotten is very specifically craft related. Um, and it was, taught to me by my, um, one of my writing instructor instructors at Mankato State University, where I got my MFA in creative writing, um, by the name of Terry Davis, who wrote Vision Quest and a, a number of other young adult um, novels. And he told me, and this was at the time I was, I was writing short stories. Um, and Terry is actually the person who encouraged me to write young adult, um, because he said I had a voice for it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he said, start your story on the day that something changes for your character. Mm. And so I kind of always try to keep that in mind as I'm, as I'm writing that. Um, the worst piece of advice is not really bad advice. It just doesn't work for me. Um, and that is to write every day. No, I write every day because that's what I do for a living. So I, I do, um, you know, outside of the marketing job that I had, now I work for a school district in communications. So I am writing every single day. This is true. And not writing fiction every single day. Mm -hmm. It just does not work for my current life. Um, and just with my other responsibilities and my job and that sort of thing, um, so I can't do that. But I will say that when I am not writing every day, I do get a little crabby. Yeah. So I'd love that, to be able to, um, but I also don't beat myself up about it if I can't. That, that resonates with me too. I mean, I feel like that write every day advice prevents a lot of people from writing. Um, but same as you, like if I, if I don't, if I don't, if I spend a lot of time without writing, it's like, it's like not drinking water or something, yeah. you know, it's like a self, it can become a self-care thing. Yeah, for sure. Um, right. We've got another great question. Have any of your short stories turned into novels? Um, no, no. Well, well that was fast. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I haven't, um, I haven't written a short story in a really long time. Um, no surprise, they all like, they're very Midwestern. <laughs> They're very do, Minnesota. Do, do <laughs> short stories occur to you or, or like are your ideas mostly just novel ideas now? Yeah, mostly novel. Um, it was very freeing for me when I wrote my first, no my first novel. Yeah. Um, and I, it felt a lot like um, just, it was very comfortable. It was like coming home and like sitting down on your favorite couch. Mm -hmm. So um you know, because with a short story, you're given about 20, 25 maybe pages to show how your character changes and grows. It's not a lot of room to work. And yeah. so when I started writing the novel, um, it just felt so, it felt so amazing because I could like go into these long sections of dialogue and witty banter and stuff like that so mm -hmm. it's very um, it's a very different um 
feeling and a very different process for sure. Liz is asking, uh, who is your favorite character in your books and who is uh, your favorite in Bend specifically? So all your books favorite, that's the first part. Well, I'm gonna have to go with Holland from Cold Day in the Sun is probably my all time favorite character. She loves Dave Grohl. She loves hockey. She, you know, listens to a lot of music. She, yeah, um, she's a lot like me, actually. I um, pictured you whenever, whenever I read that book, to be honest. Yeah. yeah. I mean, she's, yeah. she's kind of got a little bit of snarky. She's got a you know, smart mouth and she swears a lot. She's a lot. <laughs> Um, and I really loved her journey and how she grew and how she had to recognize things about herself that maybe mm -hmm. weren't, you know, the, you know, you don't, things you don't want to necessarily admit that you're going through. She sure. had to do that. So, um, wow. My favorite character in Bend. Well, I think I have kind of a soft spot for Gabe. He's going through a lot. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And he's a musician. I mean, yeah, he's a musician. He's a creative. Right. Yeah. And I actually had some um, <laughs> character art commissioned um, for this. I wish I had it. And um, there's a Boswell, actually. If you order the book from Boswell, you get this exclusive postcard that is Juniper and Gabe um, at a scene toward the end of the book. And when the artist was asking me for ideas for clothing or whatever, I sent her a picture of my husband's flannel coat that I just, I love this coat. I mean, he's had it as long as I've known him longer than that. And I just love it. And the artwork came back and it kind of looks like my husband, <laughs> like when he was younger, long hair, you know, rock star wearing this coat. So, well, that's great, and it's another reason to um, to uh, uh, buy from Boswell. I feel like yeah. I saw the art. Yeah. Maybe you put it on Instagram. Yeah, it was on Instagram. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm thinking maybe one more question. I mean, I'll I'll ask the one that's here, but maybe one more question <clears throat> if someone wants sure. to put in one more, um, beyond what I'm going to ask right now. But. Um, Kate is asking about Ted. I'm guessing Ted is named after someone in your life. Does this character have any of the same characteristics of the real Ted? <laughs> um, so <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so in my books, um, many of the characters are named after my nieces and nephews. Fun fact. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a book that I wrote before the last thing you said, it's called cloud nine. It will never see the light of day. There are about six people who have read that book. Um, and I loved it, but, um, it, yeah, anyway, it was my first go. So, you know, it's, it's okay. Um, anyway, so I had put a bunch of my nieces and nephews in that book and then that book didn't get published, but then the last thing you said did and um some of my nieces and nephews were in that one and then another group of them ended up in cold day in the sun and then um there was just one left for bend in the road and that is my nephew ted um but that is also my dad's name ted um and my dad died in 2006 and this book is actually dedicated to him and my mother I don't know if my mother is on the call tonight. I think my sister is. So my mom is probably sitting next to her is what I'm guessing. But um, so, <laughs> but the Ted in this book is quite different than either of the Ted's in real life. Um, and then after I had written it, I realized that I also um, used the names of my two uncles. So my dad was Ted and he had a brother, Chris, and he had a brother named um, Philip, but we all called him Bud, Uncle Bud. And so they all three ended up in this book. There's a Ted, a Chris, and an Uncle Bud. That's 
great. Fun. Well, that if unless there's another question, that might be a great note to end on because I feel like I mean I've loved all your books, Sarah, and I feel like they're all so heartfelt, and you put you put so much of yourself and your life in them, and that's just I mean the fact that you named your characters after loved ones is just another another piece of evidence for that. But um, and I'm so grateful that you um, have invited me to participate in all of your um, launch events so far. You're very good at it. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm working at it, on it. But, um, and again, if, if there's anyone on the call um, who has not yet bought this book, um, please do. It's a beautiful cover. Um, fantastic book. Um, and if you buy from, from Boswell, you get that, that amazing uh, art as well. So thanks everyone for coming. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Boswell. Yeah, thank you so much. And there's well, thank you. That was Rachel. amazing, thank you guys. The I always I said before, the YA crowds are the best crowds, and you guys <laughs> have proven me right today. That was amazing. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Sarah and Andrew, and um, also Wyatt as well. And um, you guys all have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. -bye.